Hello all, welcome back to Refactoring Python Code. We're beginning a new section today about pattern-based refactoring. In the last section, we looked at how to refactor classes and objects when you're programming in an OOP regime. So this section is about formally applying things called design patterns to aid your refactoring endeavors. So why design patterns? So you might have heard of design patterns and if you have studied OOP in any formal way at all, design patterns shouldn't be unfamiliar to you. I think a lot of people think about design patterns as guidelines or templates on how to design your objects and classes, the first goal. But then if you read the original Gang of Four design patterns book, they also mention that design patterns provide a target for you to refactor. So whenever you organically grow some code, and it becomes mumbo jumbo and you need to refactor it, design patterns are a great way to rationalize how you are modeling the real world or your business problem with OOP. So in this section, we're going to look at four steps to understand pattern-based refactoring. Number one, I'm going to just introduce pattern-based refactoring, just give it a little bit more depth, walk through a few patterns that we can use to refactor, some patterns are more conducive to refactoring than others. And then we're going to talk about using encapsulation methods for refactoring, which is using creational patterns to hide certain implementation details from the client class or the user class. And that allows us to clean up our code in a way that no longer can developers access your subclass directly, but they have to go through it, a common interface. In the third video, we're going to talk about how we can remove multiple checks for none in your Python code. So if you check a lot for like, you know, if this variable actually exists or if this variable has returned none, you, you have to do something else. There's this thing called a null template pattern, which we can use to reduce that kind of conditions sprinkled around your code and make your code generally cleaner. And then in the last thing, we're going to talk about Python refactoring using conditionals, how we can refactor conditional statements more effectively. So let's dive into the first video. So the first video is about pattern-based refactoring. In this video, we're going to talk about five things. So number one, what are design patterns? Number two, how design patterns provide targets for refactorings. And then I'm going to step through three of the main groupings of design patterns. We have creational, we have structural, we have behavioral. A lot of people, when they learn design patterns, myself included, this actually taught me something new, uh, the design patterns, they learn it as a good way or even the Bible on how to formalize business concepts or real world concepts or relationships into object oriented classes, right? I'm going to now step through three types of design patterns where we can spot more useful patterns, which I have myself filtered down based on my own experience on what design patterns actually get applied in real life. So number one, we have the creational patterns where the design patterns are aimed at mechanisms and logic that creates new objects. So we have abstract factory pattern which interfaces related classes without a concrete implementation of features. So this is good for thinking about how you want to actually manufacture the objects. And sometimes when you have multiple ways of instantiating an object organically, you probably have one class that loosely defines the interface, but then there's also like a little bit of implementation here and there scattered around. It's a good idea to create an abstract factory to separate away what is the interface for creating a factory and then the actual implementation of the factory itself. There's the builder pattern, which happens a lot when you're integrating software to different outlets. So for example, if you have to integrate with five different CRMs and then you also need to integrate with some marketing tools, then you need to change the internal representation of your data into the formats that fit those outlets. So what you want to do actually is using the builder pattern, you want to build the data from your database with one class with the builder pattern. And then the representation of data is actually separate from the other 
from from the class that builds the data, the representation class then takes the built tree almost and transforms it into the end data. So you would have one way of building data from the internal database, so you, you can test that. And then there are individual ways of changing that ultimate data representation into the minor implementations, you know, where it's J JSON or calling an API or whatever. Factory method, again, very common, allows the creation of instances to be defined in a subclass. So what this means is we basically put the logic around instantiating an object into another class so that it's standardized how we create new things like this. So this work used a lot in real time data streaming systems where you need to create the same concepts again and again, and you want to like make sure that the objects are created correctly. Singleton, big controversial pattern. Some people like it, some people don't like it. I know that Google company-wide doesn't use singleton. There are a lot of other use cases for singletons, especially when you're trying to run one instance of, let's say, a trading system. That's when singleton patterns are really useful. There's the second class, which are structural patterns. We have the bridge pattern, which is one class for abstraction. What features does this need? And another for implementation. So a little bit like the builder pattern, but this bridge pattern is more general than the builder pattern. So it means that we have one class for the for specification of the features of this system and the other one for the implementation of those features. So then if you're porting this system to another platform, you can just change the implementation without having to also make sure that you're not touching the feature class. The composite pattern is basically a generalized tree structure. So a composite pattern means that you have classes for nodes and also leaves and not only is this applied in things like, let's say, decision trees, you can also think of it as you can have a composite pattern for a tree of compu computation steps. So for example, the leaf node might be ingesting data from an external system, and then you combine some data into a node doing some transforms, and then you pass it on further downstream to another node, and then it ultimately it gets to the root of the tree, which is the destination of your transformed data. So that's where a composite pattern can be used. A lot of times you would have you would go from like simple scripts that are chained together to something that's more formalized using this pattern. That's where the refactoring is used. We also have the decorator pattern, which is actually should be quite familiar to you if you're using Python. We use decorators all the time. That just means adding new functionality by wrapping functions with functions. I think that's fairly useful of a way to make sure that we're not just having a, a myriad of classes to do setting up and tearing down and all that kind of stuff. Pipes and filters, again, very useful in the data processing world. Chain of operations where one output is the next input. I think this is actually fairly intuitive. Many programs are already written like this, but it is a structural design pattern that is quite useful. You should adopt it if you have it. The last section we have is behavioral patterns. So we have the iterator pattern, which allows us to access a list like an object. So instead of going index, incrementing the index and then accessing the next item of the list, an iterator allows us to call a function like next, which returns the next item from the list. Use lots in uh, Python. The no object pattern, we talked about this a little bit in the introduction. So the, a class where the, it represents the default value of a wider set of classes. So for example, if you have a client and you would want to have a default, if this client doesn't exist, you want to add it into the CRM, then what you want to do is to create a no client class. And so you don't need to check for whether the client returns true or not, or, or whether it returns an object of class client. All you need to do is say, add to CRM. And if the client already exists, it updates the CRM. The client doesn't exist, it will go into the no client class and the implementation of that add to CRM would be actually to create a new. So visitor pattern, again, very useful. We define a visitor class which recursively operates down a tree. So often used with the composite pattern, it allows you to separate action from data. So you have one data structure that represents how your things are, are done. And then you have the visitor pattern that actually defines what to do at each, whether it's like a node or a leaf.
The last thing is a template method pattern. We also talk about this in this course. So basically, you create the general idea of an algorithm. Maybe you do eight things in ABC order, but then ABC is then defined in subclasses. So that's all there is to it. Design patterns, ultimately, you can, if you're very, very diligent and you know all of your environment when you're creating your OOP class hierarchy, you should use design patterns to think about how you structure your classes. But often that's not very practical. Often you create a bunch of stuff and then you try to refactor it back into nicer structures. That's when uh, design patterns provide targets for your refactorings. And so we looked at creational patterns, structural patterns, and behavioral patterns. And those are things that you should look at yourself. And I think simply having them in your mind allows you to write better code because it's a higher chance that you write it the first time correctly. And it's a higher chance that you can refactor it correctly the first time as well.